UFC Vegas 89 is coming up next weekend, and today, guys, I have the entire card breakdown for you guys with timestamps if you'd like to skip to any particular part of the video. Hello, everybody, and welcome back to another video. If you are new here, my name is Kyle. I'm your guy with too many YouTube channels. Let's get straight into the fights for today. Starting off with the first fight, opening up the card, we have Mohamed Usman taking on Mick Parkin. Now, actually, what's funny about this, guys, is with both of these fighters' recent performance, I actually switched my tune a little bit on them. Well... More so for Mick Parkin than I did Mohamed Usman because I thought Mick Parkin coming to the UFC, he's 8 no, he's big, he's strong, he slows down the pace, he does a really, really good job of making your, you slow down. He wants to grab you, he wants to use his wrestling, he has good BJJ for heavyweight, and he's used that pretty effectively up until his most recent fight, that being against Kyle Machado. In this fight, it was a close fight, but I personally thought Machado won, but it's not nearly enough of a big deal to make it make a big deal about calling it a robbery or something so I honestly I didn't think Mick Parkin looked good at all this fight he looked like your typical heavyweight with maybe like an added takedown to it <laughs> you know there's but even when he went to the ground there wasn't anything that he really did here so I actually really really switched my tune on Mick Parkin after he took on Kai Machado because before that he looked very very good but then again you gotta worry and this is what I was talking about in my video yesterday guys you gotta worry about people coming out of these like really really small organizations and taking on opponents that really don't make him a big deal. The Really, the only promotion I really see people coming through and doing extremely well is the LFA. They're a fantastic organization. But talking about Mohamed Usman, Mohamed Usman, I think that he is just a little bit better than your bottom-of-the-barrel heavyweight. And I don't think Mohamed Usman is, like, the bottom-of-the-barrel. Don't get me wrong. It's just, there, nothing really screams to me that Mohamed Usman's that great. He's a football player transitioning to MMA, so... He definitely has strength for the heavyweight division. He typically stays on the outside with his power. He can wrestle too, and he's been wrestling a little bit more recently, and he's looked okay. He had a little bit of a hiccup before he came into the UFC, but then he ended up looking really, really good in his first fight against Zach Palga, which actually surprised me, to be honest. Then against Junior Tafa, didn't know what to think about that one, and this is the fight like I was talking about with McParkin, where really made me switch my tune on him. I apologize if you guys can hear my phone. I'm going to mute that right now. I'm very, very sorry about that. But in this fight, honestly, against Jake Collier, I think 9 out of 10 times Collier would have won this fight. Usman jabbed his fingers into his eyes so hard that it changed the entire fight. Collier was dominating, and Collier was not the same after that. I think I, I chalked that entire win up to Muhammad Usman doing that. So I really, oh man, and Jake Collier isn't good. And Jake Collier was really, really winning against him. So that's why I'm kind of sitting here and looking at it and being like, I don't know what to think, man, but... This is a very, very close fight, in my opinion. One thing that really stands out is Parkin will have a weight advantage, but Mohamed Usman is a really, really big, strong guy. I actually don't think that would really make a difference. So, because you got to worry about it when you have a guy who has, like, a 20-plus pound weight advantage on you, grabbing you and taking you down like Mick Parkin wants to do, that's something you got to worry about. But I honestly don't think that'll be a big deal for Mohamed Usman. But at the end of the day, these two are heavyweights that... I don't think are top level at all, and these two are heavyweights at kind of the same point in their career, which is very good matchmaking, to be honest with you. I'm interested to see how this fight's going to play out. I don't know how this is going to go. I think it's more of a 50-50 fight. I'm going to lean ever so slightly to Muhammad Usman because he's probably a little bit more promotable. You gotta, I always think about that stuff, like who the decision might go to if it's a close fight. Probably a little bit more promotable. He's the brother of Kamara Usman. He is, I, I, I feel like he will be the stronger guy. I just do. That's a little bit more of a gut feeling, but Mohamed Usman will probably stay on the outside. Mick Parkin does a good job of slowing down the pace, but it all depends. Can Mick Parkin get in there? I don't know. Same reach. Very, very interesting fight. I'm going to go with like a 60-40% to Mohamed Usman in this, but this is certainly not one to bet on in my opinion, unless like maybe just maybe over 1.5 rounds. I'll have to see what the line's at for that, but... Mohamed Usman is going to be my guy in this one. Moving on to the next fight. This one should be a really fun one. We have Igor Severino versus Andre Lima. Now, both of these guys are making their UFC debut, and both of them are undefeated with a near-perfect record with, I mean, like, in saying they they both looked fantastic before coming into the UFC, right? I'll start with Igor Severino. He is very, very dangerous both on the feet and on the ground. He is a, he's shown to be a pretty, like I said, dangerous fighter. He wants to come in and he wants to kill you. He has very good technique. He has no problem brawling with you, which he is. He remains dangerous in that sense, but sometimes he does get caught up in the brawl, which is a little bit worrying, especially for Andre Lima. Andre Lima, excuse me, Andre Lima coming into the UFC, shown the same. He looks very, 
very good. A lot of knockouts and, of course, stood out on the Contender Series. He's a kickboxer. Prefers to stay on the feet. If he is fighting somebody who wants to take the fight to the ground, he has shown that he has really, really good defense. So, honestly, guys, this guy, with his crazy, crazy kicks, it reminds me a little bit, and it's important to say, like, just a little bit of Edson Barboza in the sense that he clearly puts everything, everything into his kicks. He's patient. He kicks in all different areas and only throws one shot at a time. He is a very, very dominant kickboxer from what we've seen so far. And I'm a little bit higher on Lima than I am on Igor. So when you have two guys matching up like this, you have Igor who wants to come forward and just kill you no matter where it is because Igor can fight on the feet. He can fight on the ground. He can do it all, really. The only worry is, and this is a little bit of a worry on both sides, is because Igor Severino, he does have the technique, but he can get caught up in the brawl. If he hurts you, he'll come in just swinging when he doesn't need to. He just really, really wants that highlight from what it seems. So I can see this going two different ways because you have Andre Lima, who's so patient, so methodical with his striking, right? He'll stand there. He'll want to do everything with technique. When Igor comes in and wants to start brawling, and that's even an if. That's even an if because sometimes he does, sometimes he doesn't. Let's say he does come in and brawl. Andre Lima, will he be able to use his kicks and technical striking to keep Igor on the outside, maybe picking him apart when Igor throws his hands down? Or is the pressure of Severino going to get past that from Andre Lima? That is why this is a very interesting fight. Igor can also exp he can also try to explode with the takedowns, but from what we've seen so far, Lima has shown to have good defense on the ground, both with wrestling and jiu-jitsu. So, again, guys, it is a very, very good matchup. Made, the UFC did a great job matchmaking this card. I A lot of people are really crapping on this card, but I quite like it, to be honest with you. I I can see different things happening in this fight. I can see Igor having success, but I've just been way more impressed from what I've seen of Andre Lima. But you got to worry, right? Because neither guys, well, maybe Andre Lima, like he had a pretty good fight over here against Igor Talon. Like that wasn't okay. That I mean, a good performance, but that's definitely a little bit of a step up in competition. But before that, guys, like there's really nothing to ride home about, you know? You got to worry when these guys are coming into the UFC. You have a 20-year-old taking on a 25-year-old. I would imagine that would be edge Lima a little bit because that's very, very young in your career. But then again, you're 8-0. Igor will have a little bit of a reach advantage. And we know that Lima definitely will want to... <sighs> it's tough. Lima will definitely want to stay on the outside. But will that reach hurt him a little bit? Very interesting fight. At the end of the day, I've been way more impressed by Lima. His kicks are amazing. I like the patience he's shown in his fights. I like Lima. And I'm going to pick him to win. Maybe at like an 80% level of confidence. That's where I'm sitting with Andre Lima over here. I could just, I could see something going wrong. That's all. <laughs> Moving on to the next fight. We have Montserrat Rendon taking on, and I apologize. I'm going to mispronounce his name. Daria Zelikzi Yokavo Yakova. And yeah, that was worse than I thought it would be. Anyways, I'm quite excited for Daria to come into the UFC because she's actually a WMMA fighter. And I mean, she hasn't taken on anybody of significance, but she actually is a WMMA fighter that finishes fights. She wants to walk you down and hurt you. Not always with technique, but you know what? That might just be what we need with uh, this division we have here at Bantamweight. But like I said, there's nothing really that stands out over here with her record. She did have one loss that was a ground and pound TKO. And that's quite worrying coming to the UFC because that seemed to be a big hole in her game. But then she bounced back with another KO win. She's at, like I said, she's a WMA fighter who actually comes in and finishes fights, and she's taking on Montserrat Rendon, who has poor striking. She, I mean, she doesn't have bad defense, but she wants to come in and grapple you, and I think she sucks. I don't think Montserrat Rendon is good. She's 6 0. Somehow, somehow, <laughs> I'm surprised she beat Tamiris Vidal. Everybody was surprised about that. I thought she won that fight. I, was, I know it was a split decision, but like I said, she wants to come in and grapple with you. Daria wants to come in and strike with you and finish you. The only thing that makes me worry is we've seen Daria at this point have a what seems to be a big hole in her game, and it was only one fight, which is it's still troubling because you have Montserrat Rendon who wants to come in and take you down, right? But at the end of the day, I think Rendon sucks. So this is one of those fights, man. This is one of those fights. I got I'm gonna lean on the side of Daria because, like I said, she's an MMA WMA fighter who actually comes in and finishes fights. Rendon is not that case. Rendon is just your typical WMA bantamweight in the UFC, and we all know how that division is. Daria could very well fall into that category, but she might be better. 
this is a tough fight. 50-50. I'm going to lean towards Daria if he had a gun to my head on this one. Moving on to the next fight, we have Steven Nagayan finally making his way into the UFC, and he's taking on Jarno Ahrens. I'll start with Steven Nagayan because I'm happy this guy made it into the UFC because you can see by his record here, he lost on the Contender Series four years ago, but then he bounced back with a win at over at LFA and then fought two more times on the Contender Series, and he looked pretty good. He looked pretty good. I think he is a good fighter. He is a very, very well-rounded fighter. He's one of those guys that comes in, he can do pretty much anything. You want to go to the ground? No problem. You want to stand up and kickbox? No problem. You want to box? I'm good with that too. He's very good at doing, he's pretty good at all aspects of MMA and he's pretty good at adjusting his game plan to, because he can fight anywhere. He can really expose your weakness. So I'm excited to see this guy. I think he's a very, very good prospect, but he's taking on Jarno Ahrens who coming into the UFC, he has not been able to put it together. He had two pretty rough losses, but I mean, it's, not the worst thing in the world. He's a good striker. He will throw, <laughs> He will definitely be willing to throw everything with the, at you. He throws all aspects of shots, but at the end of the day, with him throwing all these shots and wanting to really take your head off, he is susceptible to takedowns, and that has been shown in his recent fights and throughout his career. So this is something when breaking down this fight, I can really see Steven Nagain because, like I said, Steven is pretty good at running through that game plan. He can see that Aaron's possibly has a little bit of a hole in his ground game. Aaron sometimes gets caught up in the striking. He will throw every piece of striking at you, whether it's a kick, whether it's a knee, whatever you want. And I can see Nagai taking advantage of that and taking Aaron's down. But Aaron's is a very dangerous striker. So the potential for him to win is definitely, definitely there. But other than that, I do like Steven Nagai, man. I do like him. I, I think, again, he is a very, very good prospect. And I don't think that highly of Jarno Aaron's. Of course, especially with MMA like this, Jarno Aaron's could definitely win this fight. He has the striking to do so, but I think Steven Ugain will be too technical, too well-rounded for him. I like him in this spot. I'm going to pick him at around an 80% level of confidence. Moving on to the next fight, we have Miles Johns taking on Cody Gibson. This should be a very, very fun fight. So we have Miles Johns. Okay, I need to be honest with you guys. Typically, I'm very, very kept up to date with this, but I don't know why this was overturned because Miles Johns won this fight and he looked very, very good. I don't know what I'm missing here. I apologize for that. I did not know until I opened Tapology that this was overturned to no contest. Um, I will do better moving forward with this. And I always want to like give you guys good reasons. I don't know if, you, if somebody filled a drug test. My apologies for that. Regardless, we're going to break down this fight. Miles Johns, Cody Gibson. Miles Johns is a very strong wrestler with both power and speed in his hands, but he can get caught up like we were talking about with a few other guys in this card. He can get caught up swinging some huge, huge shots. He's always chasing that knockout, but he does have wrestling in the back pocket. Although, as his career has been going on, he's been using it less and less. I do think he's been getting a little bit better, though. He does have really good power for the division, so it, it depends who you want to look at it. I just wish that he would mix in his game a little bit more, buddy. I mean, he has shown he has knockout power. He has crazy power for the division. He, in his last fight, especially, like, he did get the win, like I said, against Dan Arguetti. He's coming off of a very good performance five months ago where he was able to keep up with Arguetta's relentless pace and even outstruck him. Like, I thought he looked really, really good in this fight. So, again, I'm very sorry. I don't know what happened. Anyways, he's taking on Cody Gibson, who is also prefers to strike. He has, a, I don't want to say a hole in his ground game, but there, he definitely wants to stay on his feet. He's a pretty lengthy guy for Bantamweight. Like I said, he has a 71-inch reach, and he uses that length every little inch of it. Unfortunately, he's 19-9. and nine. He is not always able to put it together. You get the, like, he's had his ups, he's had his downs. He, when he's in his game, when he's just on a striking match without a threat of the takedown, he does very good. He's coming off of a pretty rough loss to Brad Katona, but I don't even really think, like, I don't want to take too much away from him because I do think a little bit highly of Brad Catone. I don't think he's like anything insanely special, but the fight was a war and both guys, like they had an incredible showing in this. They showed heart, technique, everything was on display. It's just Katona in the last round was able to really, really turn it up in the third and end up winning that fight. So I don't really take too much away from Brad Katona, the Brad Katona loss, but at the end of the day, it is a loss. Cody Gibson's a very good fighter and honestly, so is Miles Johns. It all depends for me. How is Miles Johns going to approach this fight? Is Miles Johns going to come in there and just want to knock you out like he's been showing he wants to do a little bit more and more? Because Miles Johns is a good wrestler. He has the power to do it. He has like the he has really, really good entries on his takedowns, but he doesn't always do it. Is he going to do that against Cody Gibson? Cody Gibson has a decent reach advantage, and he, like I said, he uses that length very, very well. 
The other problem is this is a 36-year-old fighting in the Bantamweight division. We all know that doesn't always work out too well. At the end of the day, though, I think Miles Johns is just a little bit better. It just worries me because if he gets caught up in the striking game, I don't know if he's going to go for the takedowns. That's why. That's what I'm stuck at. And I don't even think Miles Johns will necessarily lose in a striking battle. I just think that... I think it's more likely that throughout the exchanges in the fight, Miles Johns will get the better of most of them. That's what I kind of believe. I'm kind of like 70-30 with Miles Johns over here. I do like him to win this fight. Moving on to the next fight, and guys, this fight has fight of the night written all over it. We have Ricardo Ramos taking on Julian Rosa. This is a, like I said, a very, very fun fight. I'm excited about this because both guys have a very fun style. You have Ricardo Ramos, who is honestly, he's fantastic everywhere. He's fantastic. He's a, he, when you're standing up, he uses his range really really well, especially when it comes to the kicking game. He has very, very good kicks no matter where they, where he's throwing them, and he has sneaky good Brazilian jiu-jitsu. Unfortunately, he's 16-5, and five, and especially recently, he hasn't been able to put anything together. He's won one, lost one, won one, lost one. He's coming off the Charles Jordan loss, which was even worse because I thought that he would lose this fight, but honestly, I'm a little bit shocked that Charles Jordan was able to submit him, especially so quickly, but he's taking on Julian Arosa, who... I'm a big fan of, man, and it sucks to see him on a two-fight skid like this. Julian Arosa, he is a pretty well-rounded guy. He can take the fight anywhere, but sometimes, of course, <laughs> he lacks fight IQ because he's aggressive and wants to come in and finish you, and it's kind of shown his last two performances. He's gotten KO'd. I know that Fernando Padilla, the KO there, was controversial. At the end of the day, I thought it was a good stoppage myself, but you always got to question a guy like Julia Rosa. Julian, excuse me, I don't know why I keep saying Julia. Julian Arosa... You have a guy like him who is such a dog. He comes in really has no problem throwing himself into the firefight. He's been KO'd twice now at 34 years old. And he's been KO'd fairly quickly. You got to worry about that at this point in his career. It has any damage caught up to him because he's had a lot of dog fights, Julian Arosa. That really, really worries me. But other than that, it's a really, really fun fight. I think both guys have good stand-up. Both guys are very well-rounded. I would give the striking edge slightly to Ricardo Ramos, but again, like I said, guys, I'm excited for this card because the matchmaking is fantastic. I think the only real strength that we'll see here is Ricardo Ramos being the better kicker, but even then, I can, Julian Rose is the type of fighter to really kind of crowd you if it starts getting too much. I think this is leaning towards a 50-50 fight myself, but the only reason I'm slightly re leaning towards Ricardo Ramos is because he is the younger fighter just entering his prime, and Julian Arosa is coming off of two knockout losses, and I worry about his durability. I worry that he's getting past that certain point in his career where he's really going to be starting losing. You know what I mean? So I'm going to lean towards Ricardo Ramos at like a 55% level of confidence, but this is going to be a really fun fight, guys. I'm excited for this. I hope Julian Arosa gets the win because I'm a big fan of him. I've been watching him forever, so... I don't know. I don't know. I It's going to be a fun fight either way, but I'm going to pick Ricardo Ramos very, very slightly. Moving on to the next fight, we have Trey Ogden taking on Kurt Holobo. Now, again, like I said, guys, this is a very, very good fight, man. There, I, I'm excited for this card. So we have Trey Ogden, who is a grappler, but he does have underrated power on the feet, and he does a good job keeping to his game plan. He only wants to pretty much take you down. He's also good at finding a knock. He's also really, really good at club and summing people. He's good at knocking you down and finding a submission instead of going for just takedowns. He is very, very good at using his opponent's momentum against them while they move forward. He shoots some solid double legs. Trey Ogden is a fighter that I think is much better than his record shows because, again, you can see he's 1-1, lost 1, 1-1, lost 1. But he has taken on very good fighters in his UFC career so far, and he's had okay showings. He's coming off of a no contest against Nicholas Mata, and man, oh my god, that's ridiculous. This was a win. It wasn't a premature, well, I guess it was kind of a premature stoppage, but no, that was a ridiculous, ridiculous call. Trey dominated this fight, and he was looking so much better than we've seen him look in the UFC so far. He was dominating this fight from start to finish, doing whatever he wanted. At the end of the third, they Trey, excuse me, Trey ended up finding an arm triangle and it was in so deep. And the ref asked Mata like three times, four times. He kept saying, "Show me you're there," or he, you need to. Sh he kept saying something like, "I don't remember exactly what he was saying, but hey, yeah, Trey, er, Mata, you need to show me that you're here or show me something." And Mata didn't show him anything. When the fight was stopped, Mata wasn't out, but it was ridiculous. It was ruled a no contest, but. 
Trey Ogden was dominating this fight from start to finish, and he was going to finish the fight with an arm triangle, even though it was a little bit of a early stoppage. I hate that. I hate that fight, and I hate that the attention got taken away from Trey Ogden because he was having a very, very good performance there. Probably went a little bit too deep into that compared to what I should have, but regardless, he's taking on Kurt Hollibo. <laughs> he is a very, very aggressive volume striker with excellent combinations, and he he definitely has an all-round game, but he definitely 100% wants to keep this fight on the feet. So what's interesting about him is he fought in the UFC a long time ago, and he ended up getting cut from the UFC, but bouncing back, of course, we all know he made his way back to the UFC, and he got a nice win over Austin Hubbard, where it was a no, like... It was a decent outing for both guys, a little bit back and forth, and all of a sudden, Holobo came out with just the sneakiest triangle in the world and got a submission. So, like I said, he's a, he was a striker prefers a strike, but he definitely has a ground game to back it up. So, guys, I think Trey Ogden is going to win this fight. I do. I'm very high in him, and I know he's getting up there at age, he's exiting his prime now, but from these fights that we've seen, he's been looking better. I know he hasn't been able to put it together, but that's why it makes me so upset when this fight got called a no contest, because... I think this guy is good, and he's been putting it together. He showed that he really stepped up his game against Nicholas Mata. He has a fantastic jab. He has a fantastic all-round game. I think he's improving, and I like Trey Ogden a lot in this spot. I even think, like, with Kurt Holobo wanting to strike, I think Trey Ogden's a better striker. I think Trey Ogden is a better grappler. I just think he's a better fighter, and I'm strongly considering betting on Trey Ogden, to be honest with you. It's just the problem that Kurt, like I said... He he's he can be sneaky. He can be sneaky. Like I said, if Trey Ogden wants to take him down, Kurt, and just like his last fight, all of a sudden he's on the ground. Oh, there's a triangle. <laughs> you know, he's a very very sneaky in his Brazilian Jiu Jitsu. That's how I would describe him. Other than that, he's a good striker. But at the end of the day, it's a 37 year old fighting in one of the toughest divisions in combat sports and against a guy who I am very very high on. I think Kurt Holobo is a good fighter, but I think Trey Ogden is just better. And I'm going to pick Trey Ogden to win this fight around like honestly. I'm thinking like 90% level of confidence here. Really quick, guys, before we get into the main card, I do want to plug in the channel membership, and we have a brand new opportunity on the channel, which I am very, very excited for here. So, guys, if you're interested, the betting guide video will be out tomorrow where we dive a little bit more into particular bets that I like. But if you're interested in seeing, because I talk a lot about predictions, I talk a lot about betting. If you are interested in seeing exactly where I'm going to be putting my money where my mouth is, Check out the channel membership. Very cheap compared to other channels, and you can get every Thursday or Friday before the event. I will not only make a YouTube community post, but I will be updating with a video for members only showing what bets I'm placing, why I'm placing them. If you're interested in hearing what I'm doing, tailing, supporting the channel, whatever you want, check out the channel membership. Again, very, very cheap to other channels, but we have something that is very exciting that we will be beginning moving forward. Guys, we have a brand new sponsor on the channel. I'm very excited to talk about Odds Jam. Now, I'm going to be honest with you guys. I've only recently started using Odds Jam because now we've been talking about them, and man, is their site fantastic. You can take a look at odds from all over the place with different sports books. You can go into pretty much anything, but typically, I'm honestly, I rarely bet on anything besides UFC. I started to use Odds Jam, and I'm not even kidding with you guys right now. I love it. I love it. The thing that I like in particular is the arbitrage betting. And this is something that I've heard the name of, but until I went into it, oh my God, it is. And how often do you see this? You can bet with 0% risk. What it does, if you guys haven't heard about this, is you can take a look at different sports books and it syncs with your sports book. So it'll take you, the link will take you right to the page, right? You just have a bunch of accounts connect it with the sports books that you like, and you can place two bets on Again, and this is another thing you can take a look at is just what the odds are at on different sites. You can bet the over and under in particular for this bet here. And no matter what, you will come out with a plus. That is a fantastic idea. And I just started doing it. And man, how often do you hear about betting with a 0% risk? That is insane. It's only profit if you go to arbitrage. But honestly, you the whole site is... You can take a look at promo finders, promo converters. You can take a look at positive EVs. You can take a look at the best thing about it is you can take a look at the best odds for different sports books. I'm very, very excited for this. Guys, if you are interested in signing up for Odds Jam, the link will be in the description down below. You will get a discount on your first month. You can use code CLAMBAT or the link in my description down below and or so. You can, regardless, you can make sure even before you check out the discounts there. So if you're interested, check out Odds Jam. I've been using it. It's been absolutely fantastic. 
I can't believe how, like, the, the nice, the wonderful tools that are on there. Moving on to the main card, we have Louis Pajuelo taking on Fernando Padilla. Now, I'll start with Louis Pajuelo because he is a fun, fun fighter. He's 8-1, and one, and he has looked so good so far. He is a striker with very, very good cardio. He'll throw a lot of shots, and he will want to finish you from every position, no matter if it's just clinching, boxing, kickboxing. He's He can finish fights everywhere. He's a come-forward striker. He does a great job doing so. He got a fantastic win over Robbie King in the Contender Series, and I'm excited to see him in the UFC. Now, I want to talk about Fernando Padilla because this guy, and it, it, we'll, we'll talk about him, okay? Because he is also a long striker, but he doesn't always use his range, and that's very important to note because he has a huge reach advantage, okay? He is very aggressive, has a very good Muay Thai game, has an okay ground game, but he's definitely, definitely a striker. He's looked so good outside of the UFC, and coming into the UFC, he got a nice win over Juliana Rosa. I this was there was controversy on this stoppage. I personally thought it was a good stoppage, but man, I don't know about you guys, and you might disagree with me here because I didn't see a lot of people really talking about this. This Kyle Nelson loss, I thought was a robbery. I really did. I thought Fernando Padilla did enough to win this fight. He showed that the striking offense was really nice as usual, powerful, crisp, but unfortunately his defense wasn't there and he ended up getting rocked on multiple occasions and maybe that's why the decision could have went the other way. But when you talk about Fernando Padilla, I'm pretty sure it was Dominic Cruz when he was talking about Fernando Padilla, but he put it perfectly in the sense where he wants to find that highlight knockout so bad that when Padilla is throwing combinations, he doesn't always move out of the way. He's there to get hit. And again, I'm pretty sure Dominic Cruz said that. One of the commentators said that in his last fight, and I completely agree with it. That's the problem with Fernando Padilla. He wants to get that knockout and looked so good, so bad that he stays in the pocket. This dude has a 76-inch reach. Look at that. In the featherweight division, he can use his striking so well. He is a long striker. When he uses his range, he is so good. He is so good. But the problem is he doesn't always use that range. And sometimes he can find himself getting crowded. And that's definitely what Louis is going to do. So I can see two different things coming about with this fight. Can Louis come in? and kind of just use his volume striking constantly to get the better of Fernando Padilla, or will Fernando Padilla be able to keep this on the outside? I don't trust him to not do that. I don't. I think Fernando Padilla is a little bit of a better striker, but sometimes he makes those fight IQ mistakes that I'm like, oh man, I don't know. I don't know. I need to see more from Fernando Padilla to really be confident in him because I think he has all the potential in the world. But at the end of the day, you have Louis Pajuolo, who hasn't taken on anybody of significance. Anybody. That really makes me worry. Fernando Padilla, I, I can just see a world where he's going to lose this fight. I just can. But at the end of the day, he has that UFC experience. He's taken on really, really good guys. And he has shown that he definitely belongs in the UFC. So I'm going to pick Fernando Padilla. But I'm worried, man. I'm really, really worried. I think he should be able to keep the fight on the outside. I think he should be able to use his reach. I think he should have the power advantage. I'm going to pick Fernando Padilla at like a 60% level of confidence. Moving on to the next fight, we have Billy Quarantillo versus Yusef Zalal. Now, guys, I'm really interested in seeing whether or not this is going to be a fun fight because you have Billy Quarantillo, who's always a blast to watch, and you have Yusef Zalal, who <laughs> I don't mean to be disrespectful, but he's a very boring fighter. He, uh, we'll start with him because he is a fighter. He can pretty much do anything, to be honest with you, but he is so low volume. He likes to stand on the outside and pick his shots and just covers up. He has very good defense. He'll throw one shot at a time, and he's quite good at it. He was cut from the UFC a long time ago, but it is important to note that he did take on some pretty good competition over there. But like I said, like just in these two, Sean Woodston and Damon Blackshear, both of those are fantastic, fantastic fighters, but he got three wins after that, and the UFC just, I don't know what the decision there was, but it's time to bring him back, I guess, but it is important to note where he also took on some people that aren't really anything of significance, really, so you have Billy Quarantillo, who's 35 years old now, he is clearly, clearly out of his prime, and what I noticed, I want to talk about his last fight specifically, because you know Billy Quarantillo, he has taken on the toughest of the tough, he's always down, he's always Really, really good, but I want to talk about this Damon Jackson win because I noticed in this fight, Billy's age and or damage is finally seeming to catch up to him. While he's still offensive, he's still durable, he just didn't seem nearly as dangerous as we've seen him. 
And I know he wasn't always like this absolute killer, but I personally think that Billy Q is starting to lose a little bit of a step. And it's unfortunate because I'm a big fan of him. I really, really like watching him fight. So you have the very, very active style who have Billy Quarantillo. He's a good all-round fighter. Sometimes he can lack technique, but he can, well, he a, does a very good job at overwhelming you with aggression. You have the active style of Quarantillo taking on Zalal, who stays on the outside, like I said, wants to pick his shots. He is very, very inactive, and he can also do everything. I actually, I worry a little bit now that Billy Quarantillo is 35 years old, and like I said, I am worried a little bit from his last performance about his age or damage catching up to him at this point. If not, if everything's okay, and he showed up, if the guy who showed up against Damon Jackson shows up now, I think that Billy Quarantillo will get the win here. I really, really like this matchup for him because I think that Billy has the style where he can come forward and just overwhelm Yusef Zalal, no matter how on the outside Zalal tries to stay and throw his one shot at a time that he likes to do. I think Quarantillo's fast enough and aggressive enough to overwhelm Zalal, but you always got to worry. I don't know, because I don't think Yusef Zalal doesn't have, he doesn't have the counter-striking needed to beat Cor Billy Quarantillo. You need somebody like Edson Barboza using Billy's momentum against him. Yusef Zalal, I don't think will really be able to do that. I don't, I don't think he's a bad fighter, but I don't think he's at Billy Q's level. I think this is a good matchup for Billy Quarantillo. I think Quarantillo will come in, overwhelm him, and just do more than Yusef Zalal. I don't know if he'll find a finish, but I like, I actually really, really like this matchup for Billy Quarantillo. I think that I'm leaning towards like a 90-ish percent level of confidence. I'm picking Billy Quarantillo over here. I just think this matchup in particular is very good for him. Moving on to the next fight, guys. This is the fight on the card that I'm personally most excited for. We have Peyton Talbot taking on Cameron Simon. Two very, very hot prospects coming at it. You have Peyton Talbot, who is a very, very good flashy striker with really, really good movement and high volume. He can strike and grapple, but he is definitely 100% a better striker than grappler because sometimes he has good, here's how I want to put it. He has very good offensive grappling. He lacks a little bit on the defensive side. So coming to the contender series, this dude was hyped up like crazy, like crazy. And in my opinion, well, the takeaway from the contender series was, oh my God, Peyton Talbot's a future champion. He got the win here, but I didn't think he looked so good. He was constantly trying to be really creative with the striking, but it just most of the time ended up looking weird. It was nothing special. And like, I don't know, he broke some strike record, but he just didn't look all that good to me. So we move on to his next fight in the UFC against Nick Aguirre. And Nick is a pretty good fighter. In the first round, he showed that again, and this is what I was talking about in his defense, he was controlled on the ground. So I believe that we have officially seen a hole in his game of fans, Peyton Talbot, because even outside the UFC, he has been controlled before. Somehow he ended up finding a submission. Point being, I think Talbot is good, but I don't think he is anywhere near the level that everybody else is talking about, okay? We have Cameron Simon now, who is, in my opinion, an amazing all-round fighter with great technique and very high fight IQ, okay? He's looked near perfect in the UFC. A little bit of cheating going on with the nut shots and stuff, but at the end of the day, he gets the job done, and he got the job done against some pretty good opponents. Now, I was shocked that Christian Rodriguez beat him. And Christian Rodriguez is just, if you put a prospect against him, I guess like it's time to just start throwing all your money on Christian Rodriguez because this dude took out another undefeated prospect in Cameron Simon. And he ended up just using his grappling, overwhelming Simon, wasn't afraid to pressure forward. And Simon kind of crumbled under the pressure that Rodriguez was able to bring. Rodriguez did miss weight in this fight. So it depends how you really want to look at that. Now, honestly, guys, when you have these matchups, like this, I'm just thinking like this. I'm high on Simon. I'm not on Talbot. That's kind of how I'm looking at this. Now, if these two strike, I think Simon is just a little bit better. He, like I said, I think he displays a higher fight IQ in the game. And I think that Cameron Simon could absolutely open up the ground game against Peyton Talbot. I think if Simon decides to open up the, t the ground game, which he does have very high fight IQ, I can see Talbot trying to be a little bit creative with the striking. And that's even if Talbot could get the edge on the striking advantage. I don't know if that's even the case. I think Cameron Simon is just a little bit of a better striker. If he wants to open up the ground game, he can. And we know that Peyton Talbot can be controlled on the ground. I think Simon is good enough on the ground where he can control Peyton Talbot and not have to worry about some submission coming his way. I'm honestly really high on Cameron Simon. Even with his last loss, I, I think he's great. I think he's a great, great fighter, Cameron Simon. I am strongly considering betting on him. I just, Peyton Talbot is also good. That's a thing. I'm kind of like at a, around an 80% level of confidence with Cameron Simon on this. I just, 
I think he's great. That's all. I think he's a great, great fighter with an all-around game, very high fight IQ, and I think he's only going to get better as time goes on. Give me Cameron Simon to get this win. Moving on to the next fight, we have Edmund Shabazian taking it AJ Dobson. It's always crazy to me to see Edmund Shabazian and what everybody was saying about him when he entered the UFC and now looking at his record only winning one of his last five. That is crazy to me. That is absolutely crazy to me. So one thing that I do want to point out is while both of these guys have had hiccups in their careers, especially Edmund Shabazian, take a look at their level of opponents. They have been taking on very very tough fighters, especially AJ Dobson as well. Coming straight into the UFC has taken on some great, great athletes. So I don't look at these guys and their records and their recent record, like their recent performances, and really take too much away from him. So I think that's very important. I think both guys are still good fighters, especially when you talk about AJ Dobson. So I'll start with AJ Dobson. He's a very good striker with, he has both speed and power. He is very strong. And honestly, he does a great job uh, just flat out, out muscling people. <laughs> He's very big very strong for the division, and we all know what we're going to get with AJ Dobson. He wants to come in. He wants to really, really hurt you, okay? And that's a problem when you're taking on Edmund Shabazian because Edmund Shabazian is a very good all-around fighter when he moves forward, but the problem is he lacks defense and he lacks heart, and heart is a really, really big deal because sometimes you can see Edmund Shabazian really just kind of accept defeat, and that's a big problem because AJ Dobson could absolutely crank you. The common criticism of Edmund Shabazian, and it's it's crazy because everybody kind of says the same thing about him, and I don't want to be that guy who just repeats everything you hear about him, but Edmund Shabazian plants his feet, throws strikes, and then there you go. There's the problem with defense. <laughs> He's, he has a huge planting problem, okay? And that's not new information I want to give you, but the, the blueprint to beat Shabazian's there. You can hurt him. You can take him down, especially when he really, really starts committing to his shots. And it was so cool to see him get the win. Because he actually found a really, really crazy knockout win. But then, of course, he took on Anthony Hernandez. And that was a horrible matchup for him. I don't know, man. I think AJ Dobson's going to beat him. I just don't think that Edwin Shabazian is... He, I don't think he has that dog in him. You know, AJ Dobson definitely has a dog in him. Because if Edmund Shabazian sits there and starts throwing strikes, AJ has taken some really, really good shots. He could probably move forward through anything that Edmund wants to throw at him. And I think AJ Dobson could either take him down or overwhelm Shabazian with strikes. I just think that when you have a problem like Edmund Shabazian has, that is a huge problem. It's a huge problem. And it's important to note that he's not taking on a guy at the level of Anthony Hernandez. He's taking on A.J. Dobson. So this is a step down in competition, but I can't trust Edmund Shabazian, man. I just can't. I'm going to be picking A.J. Dobson. I think no matter what Shabazian throws at him, Dobson will be able to move forward and pretty much dominate. I'm kind of around like an 80% level of confidence for AJ Dobson. I'm going to officially pick him for the video. Moving on to the co-main event, we have Carl Williams taking on Justin Taffa. Now, the first thing is important to note that Justin Taffa is stepping in for his brother like they just did a vice versa thing. He, Carl Williams is supposed to take on Junior Taffa. Justin Taffa is widely regarded to be the better of the Taffa brothers, but both of them have the same kind of style. He is a huge heavyweight with huge power, and sometimes has some pretty good kicks to back it up, some really, really good calf kicks especially. Justin Taffa has, since he came into the UFC, has had a little bit of trouble, but then he bounced back, and he has been knockout, knockout, no contest, but knockout. He he's reminds me of Mark Hunt a little bit, but with a little bit more technique behind it. So he's taken on Carl Williams, who is a huge, huge heavyweight with he has okay striking. Sometimes he's sloppy. Sometimes he shows fight, high fight IQ. He wants to take you down. It's a little bit weird with Carl Williams because he had a lot of hype on him up until his last fight against Chase Sherman, and he didn't look so good against Chase Sherman. So I don't know, man. This one's really tough. I was I'm I'm kind of not on the train that everybody else is with Carl Williams that he's like this crazy, crazy top ten future contender heavyweight. I think he's kind of like on the similar level of Justin Taffa. If you want to have these two match up, like typically it's one of those heavyweight fights where anything can happen. But at the end of the day, I think Taffa is more dangerous. I don't think Carl Williams is nearly fast enough, whether it's with the striking or with the entries that Taffa won't be able to catch him. And I could see Taffa kind of chewing up the legs just a little bit. My only worry is this fight is on short notice. But then again, Taffa doesn't necessarily have the fight style where <laughs> he, he uses a ton of energy. Usually his fights are pretty quick. So I don't know. The potential for Carl Williams to win, the game plan's absolutely there. He can take him down. He can kind of stay on the outside, but I think it's pretty likely that Taffa ends up catching him 
You got to worry about Williams' reach, but I don't know. I just got a little bit of a gut feeling on this one for Justin Toffa. I'm not confident in it whatsoever, but my pick for the video will be Justin Toffa. I'm kind of sitting at like maybe a 65, 70% with Toffa. Not, yeah, I think he'll win, but anything could happen in this fight. Moving on to the main event, we have Amanda Hebas taking on Rose Namajunas. This is a very interesting fight because it is important to note that this fight is at 125 pounds. Okay, let's get into it. So Amanda Hebas, you know... She has had mixed success, but actually, as time's been going on, she's been looking better and better. It is important to note, though, she hasn't taken on nearly the level of competition that Rose Namajunas is taking on. Rose Namajunas has been in there with the best of the best. She's beaten a lot of the best in the best, but I want to talk about this most recent performance against Panhiro just three months ago. Amanda Hibas showed, I think there was a huge jump up in level, like, between, like, I mean, like, her improving her game. Between Macy Barber and the rest of her fights, is she's shown a little bit of improvement throughout, but I think there was a huge jump up because it was a very, very good display of skills. And Pinero actually had a good performance there too. Like both girls had their moments, but in the third round, Hebos just turned it up a notch and found a finish. She looked like a killer in this fight. She looked really, really good. But she's taking on Rose Namunez, who we all know Rose. We've been watching her forever. It's surprising to me that she's 11 and 6, to be honest, because she's beaten the best of the best. She has won, she's beaten Wei Li Zhang, the greatest female mixed martial artist of all time. She's beaten Joanna Yernjacek. She has looked so good. I can't believe she beat Wei Li twice. That's crazy to me. But of course, she's coming off of two losses, which the Carlos Barza, you can just erase that from her record because that wasn't a fight. But then she, this is her first fight at flyweight against Manon Ferro. And in this fight, she was a clear step behind the whole time. In my opinion, she is definitely not built for flyweight because, it, like, look at Rose. She is, like, a stick, right? The shots visibly, visibly hurt her, and she was wearing the damage. She didn't get destroyed in this fight. I just think that this fight showed that she's not built for flyweight. So, you got to think about this. Amanda Hebas was also a strawweight. So, is the move up to flyweight really going to make that much of a difference? Here's the biggest problem for me. When looking at these two girls, I think that Rose Namajunas is clearly the better fighter everywhere. Everywhere but I don't trust her. I don't trust her to win. Amanda Hebas has been making a lot of improvements. Rose had a horrible performance at 125, and if you listen to any of Rose's interviews or follow Rose at all, this girl seems a little bit checked out. I was just worried about that with Tai Tuivasa. She seems like she doesn't want to do it anymore. She just wants to go and do her own thing, play music and farm or whatever she's doing. I think, she, I think it was farming one of them. Regardless, she seems like she's done with MMA. The fans have turned on her since Carla Sparza. That visibly bothered her. And she, like, I don't know. She all of a sudden just doesn't seem interested in martial arts anymore. So you got to question how hard she's been training. Perhaps she could be built for 125, but wasn't prepared for it. I think she is better. I think she is better everywhere. Like I said, jujitsu, Muay Thai, kickboxing, boxing, whatever you want to do. Wrestling. I think she's flat out better. But at flyweight... Amanda Hebas looks like a killer so far. Rose Namajunas is not built for the flyweight division. And I really, really worry about her motivation level. That's why it's tough. I, like I said, Rose is better. My guts tell me not to touch this with betting. I'm still going to pick Rose Namajunas to win because she's better. <laughs> but I could very well see her being completely checked out from this, and that's why I'm worried about it. I'm at Rose Namunez at like a 60% level of confidence here. I don't trust her, but I think she's better. Rose Namunez is going to be my pick, though. With that being said, though, guys, that puts an end to the full card breakdowns and predictions for today. Thank you so much for being here, and thank you so much for watching the video. Check the description down below. Check out Odds Jam. It is very, very fun. Let me know what your picks are going to be down below, and in the meantime, check out this video on screen for you right here. I will see you either there or in the next one, guys. Take care.